Walk that way. All right, you're good. Thoroughly mortified, hiding his face. 
When Haman had finished telling his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him, his knowledgeable friends who were there and his wife Zeresh said, If this Mordecai is in fact a Jew, your bad luck has only begun. You don't stand a chance against him. You're as good as room. While they were talking, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried Haman off to the dinner that Esther had prepared. And may God bless the reading of his word. Give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth.
uh, read that a bit ago, so our minds are hopefully moving in that direction. And today, we get to uh, just see God act on things that He had begun to set in motion years before. And it's an incredible story. And it's also kind of a comical story in a rock sort of way. How many of y'all have seen uh, kind of an embarrassed, someone go through an embarrassing situation where roles are kind of switched up or something changes and, and the outcome is kind of humiliating for someone? Have you seen that? Yeah, probably. Like, how many of y'all watched the 2015 Miss Universe pageant? A couple of you did. I did not. I'm actually on a 36 year streak of not watching the Miss Universe pageant. I plan to keep that going for a couple more decades. Uh, but in that year, Steve Harvey was the host. Now, Steve Harvey is hosted off a lot. He's, he's very good at it. Uh, good presentation, good stage presence, can, can work some lighthearted humor in various situations. He's the host. Then you go through the whole event there, getting ready to crown. The Miss Universe of 2015, he walks on stage and enthusiastically proclaims that Miss Columbia was the Miss Universe. And she was crowned in all the glitter and the paper pieces and all the things. Are, are, it's just so wonderful. All the girls are crying for one reason or another. Harvey walks off stage and then he comes back and says, I have to apologize. Because he read the wrong name. Because the true winner of the Miss U.S. or Miss Universe passion that year was Miss Philippines. And he had to correct himself. And then they had to take the crown from Miss Columbia and give it to the Miss Philippines. Can you imagine how embarrassing it would have been to be Steve Harvey on that night? I remember listening to the the news and, and the, the ways he got made fun of, and I kind of started to feel sorry for the guy, because it was an honest mistake. The envelope was right. Everything had all the right information. just went out there how embarrassing it was to watch him have to go out there and say, I made a huge mistake and correct him. But he did, and he should, and, and that's respectable, right? Today, according to God's perfect plan, his perfect purpose, and then the way God, but in the way that only God can move and arrange things, we get to see Haman get what's coming to him. God's gonna, <laughs> God's gonna have his day with Haman. He's gonna right some wrongs, and it's going to be rather embarrassing for him. And then I take church. The, the main takeaway tonight: it, it, there's kind of there's kind of this human inclination when we watch someone like Haman get what's coming to them, and get punished, that's the main thing we like to focus on. Right? We like to see someone who has done awful things get what's coming to them. The church, while that may be our natural inclination, we got to set that aside today because the main thing that we want to watch today is the way that God orchestrates events and the way that God's timing is executed the way that things are all coming together just like God had planned so the life of the Jewish people will be preserved. Now, to be honest, I don't know that I can completely take it out of me that I like to watch him to get what's coming to him. But let's not let that be our main takeaway today, but rather let's look at how incredible God really is and how his purposes really don't fail. Like I've said often before, God always gets his way. And how that he will take events and mesh them together at just the right time to accomplish his plan. Now we've got uh, following a very typical outline as we follow through uh, the, our study on this to help us break down what's going on. We're going to look at really the three primary people that play a part in today's story. First we look at Xerxes. Now we know a lot about him, but the way that God uses him is rather creative today. And again, one thing we always need to remember is that God can use anyone. Xerxes didn't even have a say in whether or not he was going to be used by God. He just was. Because God does what he wants to do without our permission. 
because he's God. All right, I love what I read as I begin to look at, at Xerxes' role. It says, people act out their lives according to a small repertoire of habits, values, and ambitions. God arranges and brings together those elements that propel his purpose and achieve his intention. So God shapes people. People are shaped in a particular way. People do things in a particular way. They think the way. They act the way. And when God is ready, he uses people's natural inclination and feeds that into their role in accomplishing his plan. And that's very true of both Xerxes and Haman today. Xerxes, here are some things that are just natural about him that God's going to use to accomplish his purpose. He is selfish. Xerxes is just a very selfish person. Very self-centered. He is the, the most powerful person in the world, and he thinks about that all the time. He's very egotistical. Goes right along with being selfish. All right? He loves pomp and circumstance. He loves it. He wants to put on the biggest display possible. We learned this initially when he threw a six-month party to celebrate how great he was. He just didn't send out a news brief that said, hey, kingdom of mine, just remember, I'm wonderful. Don't forget that. No, he threw a six-month party so that all the other powerful people in the world would come and look at how great Xerxes was. Xerxes loves to put on production. He also rarely does anything without seeking advice. And I don't think this is a confidence problem. I don't think it's an ego problem. I think that's just how he was wired. That as he ruled the kingdom, as he did things, and made decisions that were incredibly important, he did so with the advice of others. And God's going to use that in just a few moments. He is also prone to give lavish gifts on those who please him. So when someone honored Xerxes, he rewarded them greatly. And he rewarded them with the full weight of being the leader of the biggest nation on the, on the world right now. King of the Persian Empire, he rewarded someone, he rewarded them. And this all kicks into high gear, and God uses all of this when he loses a night of sleep. We're going to get to that in here a bit. But, but God is going to combine all these things at just the right time. He's going to use who Xerxes is, how he is hardwired, and God will say, I'm going to use all that right now to do exactly what I have for you. And it's incredible to watch that unfold. Haman is also going to act according to his nature and his heart wire. We see Haman's self-absorption and his ego come out when, when he says the line, who is it that the king would want to honor more than me? I mean, how narcissistic does it get? Now, yes, he's the second most powerful person in the Persian Empire. That's a level of power that's pretty significant. But man, did he bask in the glory of being elevated or promoted to that position. And when he goes to approach the king with the take Mordecai's life that day, since he's there, he's going to be brought in to see Xerxes. And Xerxes is going to say, what do we do? To honor the person that significantly pleased the king and hand it goes, he's got to be talking about me. And if you got to design your own reward, you drop, you design a pretty good one too, right? Especially if there wasn't an ounce of humility in you at all, which is true of that. So he's going to develop the most extravagant reward that he could think of because he thinks. It's coming to himself. Zeresh, Haman's wife, also plays a... She delivers a pretty potent message. She's going to come into play in the last few verses. We also 
uh, talked about her and the advice of, of Haman's other closest friends and how if your friends give advice like Haman's friends do, get new ones. All right. So Zeres, he goes home just absolutely. Haman goes home so dejected. Just, just devastated and humiliated. And probably just his, his shame is great because here he went to take the life of a man. Instead, he's going to parade him around the kingdom on a horse. We talk about how well Mordecai honored the king and pleased the king. He's going to get home and, and his wife is going to be the mouthpiece of God. And this gets back to church. And God uses who he wants to do what he wants. We don't always need to get in it. And the rest, she doesn't even know she's being used by God, but she sure is right now. Because when he gets home to his wife, his wife makes it, Haman's wife makes it clear. Mordecai's with you, your bad luck has just begun. That's how the message phrase it that I read earlier. If this is true, if you have opposed the Jewish people, and if Mordecai is a Jew and he has pleased the king, it's just getting started. There's going to be no limit to what's going to happen in your life or the negative if all this is true. And as we know, all of it was very true. And man, we begin to see God work in such incredible ways in the character in these three characters of our story today. And he does it at just the right time to accomplish his purpose. Man, God uses who we are when he needs it. God, God takes, takes the truth about who we are. I pray the prayer before God. Take everything I know about me right now and help me give it over to you. Okay? God takes everything we know about ourselves and he uses that. And there will be things that are true about us that God will at just the right time to accomplish his plan and purpose. There's a characteristic about you. Or there's a, a love you have, a talent you have, a skill set you have, a desire you've had, and you've never quite figured out how, how could this be used. I tell you, at just the right time, when things are, are perfect in God's eyes, He's going to use that in a way to accomplish exactly what He wants And right now, God's going to use what's true about these men that's not favorable. But He's going to use it to accomplish His Purpose. Let's look at what all takes place in this story. The first aspect of our plot, if you keep your notes along, is that the king can't sleep. This is not a coincidence, church. Not a coincidence at all. In fact, the Old Testament, which was originally written in Hebrew, it was later translated into Greek, when Greek was the primary language. And when they translated this verse into Greek, it read, the Lord took sleep. From the king that night. Wasn't just that he had a cup of coffee too late in the evening, or maybe he had a little indigestion of some sort. No, God refused to let the king fall to sleep. And I'm sure that he had all sorts of regiments, uh, all sorts of ways that they, they would have helped keep the king fall asleep to get the rest he needs. My, my gut says that they had already went through those. And he still can't sleep. Because God took it from him. So that God could clearly get Xerxes' attention. So that God could, could get Xerxes moving in the direction that God wanted him to move to accomplish what God wanted to accomplish. Another thing I read uh, this week is, is uh, in spite of having all the power of the Persian Empire at his disposal, Haman's carefully laid plans were turned against him simply because the king had a sleepless night. So let, let's, let's marry those. They, they weren't written together, but let's move together. Okay, God took sleep from Xerxes. Haman had developed this ironclad strategy to annihilate the Jews. It was in motion. It was signed into law. There's, there's not going back on it. Everything is going exactly how Haman, Haman has planned. But at just the right time, God takes sleep from Xerxes, and Haman's plan is going to get turned inside out. 
This is how a sovereign God works. Because when we see chaos, God says this is all coming together just like I had it. And this is what is happening in the kingdom today. The king, to try to help him fall to sleep, is going to have the historical chronicles or the history, really almost a day-by-day -day journal read to him of everything that had happened in the Persian kingdom around Xerxes' leadership. And they're going to go to an event that took place five years earlier. It's five years, as we read chapter 6 and 8, it's five years since Mordecai had, um, had discovered and passed along the plot that Xerxes was going to be assassinated. And that's where they're reading. And again, there's no way that you just magically turn to that page but for the hand of God turning to that page for Xerxes. And he's reading about Mordecai. Learning of the plot, he passes the news on to Esther. Esther takes it to Xerxes. Xerxes' life is spared. And Xerxes asks the question, what did we do for this guy? How did we reward him? Because those details were not included in the story. And remember what I talked about when we talked about Xerxes. Xerxes lavishly rewards those who honor him or who are loyal to him. That wasn't a new trait. Five years ago, that would have been true. So Xerxes was sitting here five years later going, look, I take care of those who take care of me. What did I do to take care of Mordecai? And they responded, sir, nothing. We didn't, we didn't do anything for this guy. He didn't so much as get a thank you card or, or a, a gift card to go out for a nice dinner. Nothing. Nothing was done for Mordecai. Why was nothing done? Why did the king override his natural desires? Because God said so. Because God said, I don't want Mordecai rewarded today. Because I need him rewarded five years later to stop a plan that's been set in motion to take out the lives of my chosen people. It wasn't on accident. It wasn't an oversight. It wasn't because Xerxes got caught up in the moment of celebrating his life being saved. It's because God said so. He said, this is when I will reward Mordecai. Not today, not tomorrow, but in five years. All right, church, we're going we're gonna to pause here. We're going to do another side one. We do these quite a bit. And y'all are going to help me make my point, okay? I want some group participation here. I think y'all are up to this. What time of day did the angels appear to the shepherds? Middle of the night. When did the angel appear to Mary and Joseph in vigil? Middle of the night. Y'all are supposed to say that. This <laughs> All right, church, we're going to when did God speak to Samuel to tell Samuel the message he was to, to deliver to Eli? All right, you got one more. When did Abraham wrestle with an angel? No, it was Jacob that wrestled with an angel. I caught y'all sleeping on me. God works in profound ways on sleepless nights that he causes. I have found that sometimes when I don't give my attention to God during the day, he will get it. And he will get it in the middle of the night. And sometimes even when I've been trying to give God my attention at some point during the day, he'll still get it in the middle of the night. And that's not just to be annoying so that we're tired and cranky the next day. It's because that's when he's the most apt to get my undivided attention. Because at 2 a.m. in the morning, there's, there's probably not any dishes that need to be done, the homework's done, I put my laptop away for the night, there's no TV on, no football game I want to watch. And when he wakes me up, and when God wakes someone up, he gets them awake. 
Church, if you wake up in the middle of the night and can't go back to sleep, sometimes it's time we start listening to God. Sometimes we need to talk to Him, but I found in a lot of these times, He's woke up in the middle of the night not to ask me what's on my mind, but to tell me what's on His mind about my life. Don't waste a sleepless night and allow God to use that to His fullest capability. Next part of our plot is going to be that Haman plans Mordecai's honor. And how ironic is this? Look at the, and then this is where our, our human side says, look at the poetic justice. Haman's going to get what's coming to him. This is going to be great. Pop the popcorn. The night before, remember, the banquet, Haman goes home. He runs across Mordecai. Mordecai doesn't bow to him. He goes home and says, what do we do with this guy? I'm so consumed with anger. And they say, build 75 foot tall gallows and we are going to hang Mordecai on And make a spectacle of him. So this is what happens when you don't honor Haman and when you don't follow the king's orders to honor Haman. So he had those built overnight. Now, to begin this gets back to just how powerful Haman is, all right? That takes some, some people got to be willing to follow your directions and, and feel commanded to follow your directions because the construction crew had to be found and worked all night long to build those galleries because he's going to show up at Xerxes' palace at dawn to request the life of Mordecai. All right? Haman goes to the palace early. Xerxes, and, and, and again, the timing of this is so precise according to God's hand. Because just as Xerxes is realizing we didn't do anything for Mordecai, his heart is saying, no, 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 that doesn't fly in my kingdom. We are going to honor Mordecai. And he asks, who's in the court? Because again, Xerxes rarely makes key decisions without advice. And they say, well, well, Haman's here. Haman just arrived. So at the exact time that Xerxes realizes we never did anything for Mordecai, is the exact time that Haman had everything in place and was going to ask for Mordecai's life to be handed over to Haman and hung on the gallows. They usher Haman in to the king's presence. And Xerxes says, what are Haman telling me? What do we do for the guy that the king is greatly pleased with? And Haman goes, who else is he talking about with me? Who else? And then he thinks that would be the most extravagant way for the king to honor himself. And the king, Xerxes, looks at Haman and says, go do that. Don't leave out a detail. Oh, but by the way, it's not for you. It's for your sworn enemy. And something I read that ties all this together so well is, is this. When it seems God is not acting, he may be most at work. He may be most present when he seems most hidden. God is just up in heaven massaging all of this together. So that at just the right time. Haman, the author of a bill to genocide the Jews, is going to be removed from the picture in short form. And we'll see how the gallows and all of this works together next week. Mordecai is going to be rewarded, yes. But this sets into the motion Haman's demise. And that's not just so God can get even. It's so that God can more clearly lead Xerxes to to provide a path for the Jews to live. 
Come next week, we'll talk a lot more how that works, but that's just, that is how all of these motions continue, all of these things continue to be set in motion, is that Haman needs to be removed from the picture so that the Jews can most directly be saved, uh, that, that whole thing can happen with the least amounted, amount of hindrances involved. And it is part of that process. Mordecai gets honored for his work in saving the life of the king. The third thing we read is Haman, third key aspect of our story, Haman goes home devastated. He has been publicly humiliated because he had to execute the king's wishes in honoring Mordecai. What he had designed for himself as a reward in a celebration will now be carried out by Haman toward his sworn enemy. The guy that less than 24 hours ago made Haman so angry he had to take his life. He will now be announcing the king is so pleased with Mordecai as he leads a horse that Mordecai sits on throughout the kingdom. And he goes home with all of that bruised ego Embarrassed, angry, hurt. He goes home and his wife is going to add insult to injury and said, Honey, this is only begun for you. Mordecai's a Jew. It's just getting started. Because God was going to have his way. The reason why it was just beginning for Haman is not because she could forgive Xerxes reaction, but because she had God, because her words came before God inspired. And it was a warning now from his wife. His wife was the mouthpiece of God to say, you proposed my plan, and you're going to suffer the consequences. It's only just begun for you, Amen. Let's look at our key truths that I want us to all walk away with today. Uh, first is that God does bless those who honor Him. This is a real complex passage because there's a lot of different things that are true. And, and they all work together, but they all work together a little differently. But one truth is that God blesses those who honor Him. God is going to bless Mordecai. He's absolutely going to bless Mordecai, both spiritually and practically. He wasn't promptly rewarded when he revealed the plot of Xerxes' assassination. Nothing happened. Again, not even a formal thank you for the king. But God's going to reward him in God's time. Now, here, here's what I believe to be true. The reward for Xerxes is about the assassination plot being served. I believe the reward from God is coming as a result of Mordecai's faithful service over the last five years in helping Esther be positioned to be used by God. I think it is the coaching and the mentorship and the way Mordecai Himself and the way he led Esther to reveal their faith and to take a stand and to be used by God, the way he powerfully looked at this daughter of Meteor of hers and said, God's going to get his way, but if you refuse to be a part of it, you're going to suffer the consequences. The way he would say such direct words to the queen of the Persian Empire. That's why God is blessing Mordecai. It's a great thing that Mordecai revealed the assassination that motion too, because that's something that God needs to be able to use to get Xerxes' attention, to set into motion the other things and the greater things that God's going to accomplish. God is going to bless the faithfulness of Mordecai. But church, we also want to remember as we look at our own lives that God's blessings are not contingent upon public recognition. All right, there's a good chance that you could live a faithful life unto the Lord for 60 years and never ride on a horse throughout the Persian Empire as a blessing from God. 
but God will bless you nonetheless. And it can come in a variety of different ways. Some people are faithful to the Lord. They serve Him. They honor Him. They do all the right things. God is so proud of them. And they are billionaires that get to be philanthropists for God's kingdom. That's not my story. Some people do all the right things, and it just always seems like life falls their way. It's not my story either. Some people try to, to live their lives honoring the Lord and doing all the right things, and God blesses it. It's just not always seen in public. So, church, as we do our best to honor the Lord, Keep your, your eyes and your hearts open to ways that he's recognizing them. And when it seems like no one is paying attention, when it seems like you're not getting any recognition at all, God's blessing your obedience. Just look for those ways. Our heart's not always going to feel it. That's why I remind us some, often that our, sometimes our heads need to tell our hearts what to see. God's going to bless Mordecai for his faithfulness. He's probably not going to bless our faithfulness the way he did Mordecai. But he's going to bless it. So keep your eyes and your hearts open so that you can see it and you can receive those blessings when God gives them to you. All right, third, second key truth. Sorry, second key truth is God's timing is. God's timing is absolutely perfect. We will say a lot in church life that God is never late, God is never early, He is always right on time, and that is a, a coy way to, to express a deeply true fact of the world we live in, that God's timing is always perfect. Uh, I want to read another quote right as part of God's preserving Mordecai, we also see why he did not allow Mordecai to be rewarded earlier by the king when he divulged the assassination plot. As always, God's plan and timing are for our best and beyond what we could imagine. Right, church? His time is perfect because if, if in the moment Xerxes would have acted on his natural tendency to reward those who honor him lavishly, this would have happened five years ago. But it wasn't just that this, this, what God's doing is not just about honoring Mordecai. In fact, that may be a very small aspect of it. What God is doing is he is starting to remove Haman. Because Haman stood in direct opposition to what God is trying to accomplish. And as long as as Haman is there opposing the work of God, it's going to be a barrier in God preserving the life of his chosen people. So he will delay Mordecai's honoring for five years until it is just the right time to remove Haman and end the plan to genocide the Jews. I bet that was hard on Mordecai. Let's just be honest with that you do something incredible, and you know the king likes to, to do incredible things for those who, who please the king. And you think, this servant please the king. Why am I not getting honored? And then you watch Haman get promoted, who's written a law to take the life of your entire Man, this was probably hard. Man, I bet this ate him alive from time to time. I think hey, I think poor guy shows some tremendous character throughout the book of Esther. But I bet that that not getting a reward and, and seeing others get rewarded so lavishly from time to time wore thin on Mordecai's spirit. Church, life is going to wear thin on our spirit. We are going to spend a lot of our spiritual lives waiting on God to accomplish something. I read a J.D. Greer quote, a president of our convention a couple weeks ago, 
and it, it, the sentiment was that none of us want to hear that we're going to spend most of our time waiting on God, but it's true. And it's true. Man, we will pray prayers for years and years sometimes before God will answer. Sometimes God will, will see God's hand at work, but it's not going to bring the result we want until down the road. And we need to trust His timing. Is that easy? Absolutely not. But remember what I read for a bit ago. God's timing is always perfect. It's always perfect. And so if we find ourselves maybe like Mordecai was and feeling a little bit sour about how things are and how things are going, sometimes we just got to make our hearts pause and say, you know what, God? I know you're at work. I know you're accomplishing things on my behalf. I don't know what or when or how, but I'm going to do my best to trust you. Because I know when things are ready, you're going to move. And then I will see, looking over my shoulder, why you did what you did when you did it. Or maybe we won't. Either way, we have to trust God's time. That is incredibly hard to do. Very hard. But we're going to wait anyway. So the best thing we can do for our own spiritual health is to wait and trust. Knowing we can trust the loving God who's in complete control, and knowing we can trust the timing of a God who can arrange events and circumstances to complete his good and perfect plan that he will complete. Third truth I want us to remember as we walk away today is that God sees when others don't. Because we are, part of what we do talk about is that God blesses those who honor him. God blessed Mordecai. God could have removed Haman without blessing Mordecai and without having him honored, but he chose to do both. As a way to, at least in Mordecai's heart, God could say, I'm seeing your life of faithfulness and I'm rewarding you. Because he doesn't have him to just die of a heart attack to get another way. He accomplishes two things at once. Both beginning to remove pain, which we unpack even more next week, and blessing Mordecai. I mean, so much of Mordecai's faithfulness was hidden from the world around him. No one saw these things. The other Persian people aren't probably watching Mordecai live his life. And think, wow, he is so faithful to the Lord. I want to be like that when I grow up. No, Mordecai's faithfulness is displayed in the day in and day out crying and honoring the Lord in his daily living. His, his most notable points of being faithful to the Lord are when he challenges Esther. I mean, that is, that is the moment we look to so often in Mordecai's life as one of the most pivotal moments in the whole book. And that was done by a messenger, and only two people knew what Mordecai said, Mordecai and Esther. The messenger didn't even know. It would have been written. No one saw all this, but God did. And so much of what we will do to try to honor the Lord doesn't get picked up on by the people around us. But God sees it, and God will bless it. There's nothing glamorous about waking up every day to try to do the right thing according to biblical teaching and to honor the Lord. But God will see that and God will bless it. And we need to train our hearts to be content with the blessings of God whether or not that gets us public recognition or not. You know, there was a song that we sang often as I was growing up uh, throughout my late childhood and my teen years, and it was called Thank You by Ray Bolts. And some of you may have heard this song, but it told the story uh, in song form of a guy who lived a very vanilla Christian existence. He wasn't a pastor, never wrote books, never spoke to conferences, never did all these public things that we often and appropriately revere. 
and some of our more front line, out, out front Christian leaders. This guy taught Sunday school, he gave missions, and he just tried to make it an influence on the world around him in the best way he knew how he could. And the stories, the, the story is that this, the, the song is something from the perspective of someone who has a dream, and he gets to watch this guy go to heaven, and there are just lines of people there waiting for him in heaven that he had made an impact on. Now, I don't know how theologically or biblically accurate that is, that when we get to heaven, we, we have a welcoming party of all the people we made a difference in, and I don't necessarily see that in Scripture, but I do think it really well illustrates the fact that as we honor the Lord, as we make a spiritual impact in, in common ways, in the life of our family, our neighbors, our closest friends, while they may never get public recognition, God sees all that and He's using all that. And He will bless all of that, either on this side of eternity or on the next. Mordecai was faithful to the Lord for decades before he got this big moment of public honor. And let's be realistic, church. Most of us, man, that public honor may never come. And that's okay. Because what we have to remind ourselves of is that it is worth it to honor the Lord in our daily living. It is worth it to grind it out living a life according to biblical principle. Because God sees that, and God will bless that. And at some point in eternity, we will reap the benefit of a life spent honoring the Lord. Man, this is a load of passage. And even as I, you know, it was, I, I believe late Sunday night as I was typing on my initial draft out and sending it to Kitty, I, I thought we were going one way. And, and, and I've learned so much more this other way. And I thought, oh yeah, God's going to honor Mordecai. And this is the part we all love because Henry gets what he's coming to him. And God's going, you're missing it. And all those things are true and all those are noteworthy. We don't oppose in God's work. There's going to be consequences. We don't want to forget that God will, in fact, bless those. But we sure got to remember as we walk away how God orchestrates things. And how God takes all of these things that go on in the world around us, and at just the right time, He brings them all together. And it accomplishes the good and perfect plan. Let's pray. God, I come before you, thankful for today. Thank you for. Everything you taught me, everything we've learned as we work through the book of Esther, God, I just, I, I, every week I think we're all, we're all being challenged with the knowledge of just how true it is that you are good, and that you are in control, and that you are accomplishing things, and God, as we wrap up Esther over the next few weeks, may, may we allow these truths to continue to impact our lives, God, that we would focus on everything we've learned from this time and, and, and let that influence the way we, we view our lives and our future as a church and, and all these things, God. As we uh, come to a close of our service today, God, uh, help us all to walk away with one, man, one major thing that will stick on our minds and that will shape our hearts this coming week, whether it's a verse or a, a way the truth was presented, God, that for all of us, we would be reminded of something that's true and something that we need to remember this coming week. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Would y'all please stand? <laughs>
Numbers 6, 24 through 26 reads, May the Lord bless and protect you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look with favor on you and give you peace. Thanks so much for coming out to church this morning. Have a great week, and we will see you all next Sunday. Thank you.